and it's my great pleasure to welcome please. Please, please. ENT problems in uh, Down syndrome. As you know that uh, Professor Mohan Kameswaran is uh, one of uh, the greatest friends of uh, Down syndrome society has been helping us for a very, very long time now. And he is uh, the recipient of the prestigious Padma Shri from none other than Professor uh, APJ Abdul Kalam. He is uh, uh, ENT specialist uh, he's an academic founder of uh, Murph Institute of Speech and Hearing in Chennai. And he also provides advanced training in audiology and speech language pathology. Uh, I've had a, a great privilege of uh, uh, seeing him in close quarters and the extraordinary way in which he not only treats his patients, but also his students and his uh, academic interests are uh, way beyond uh, imagination for his tremendous amount of publication. One of the big, big, uh, most important things he does is uh, called auditory brainstem implantation surgery. And he did the first auditory brainstem implantation surgery in South and Southeast Asia. And also the first pediatric brainstem implantation surgery in Asia. And uh, so this is something which we are proud of. And uh, so many uh, children have been able to hear uh, because uh, of his intervention. And uh, he is also a recipient of the Padma uh, and also uh, in Sri Lanka, he, uh, they presented with the award of excellence for service. And also Arthur C. Clark, the famous writer, he got an award of service from them. The government of Kerala has awarded them for award of excellence. And the National Academy of Medical Sciences um, has uh, made him as the uh, honorary fellow. And uh, the government of Tam Tamil Nadu selected for the Tamil Nadu Scientist Award in 2008. And the MGR Medical University conferred the degree of Doctor of Science uh, on him uh, in the year 2009. So this is uh, Professor uh, Mohan Kameswaran to you. I don't want to take any much more time. Uh, we are going to have a great interactive time. Please feel free to ask a lot of questions and be quite happy to answer. Professor Mohan, please. Share your screen. <laughs> Mohan, you can, uh, you, you, we are not able to hear you. You need to unmute your mic. You need to unmute your mic. Can you unmute your mic, please? Right at the bottom, right hand corner, there's a mic button. No, no, no. Uh, can you unmute your mic, please? Ah, hello. Yes. Yes. No, no. We lost you again. You got muted again. And now? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Very well. Very well. Yeah. Right. Now I will uh, try and share the room. Uh, are you able to see the? Uh... Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so first of all, uh, 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 big thanks to Professor Suresh and to the Down Syndrome Federation of India for uh, this unique opportunity. I really am very grateful to them for having uh, given me this uh, uh, very important uh, assignment. Uh, I think uh, there have been a number of questions which have already been sent to me. Uh, what I plan to do is to uh, go through the uh, 
the spectrum of problems that uh, are uh, seen in, in my domain of ear, nose, and throat diseases. And after which, you know, we'll have time for questions. Uh, we can definitely, if I can take on any number of questions, you know, and try and lay your uh, notes. So let's, uh, let's look at uh, uh, the uh, uh, problems that children with uh, trisomy 21 uh, get in the field of ear, nose, and throat diseases. Um, of course, we all know that it's a, it's a, a non-disjunctional mutation uh, which results in trisomy 21. It's a commonest uh, chromosome anomaly uh, and very uh, described as early as 1866. There are several morphological or, or uh, anatomical abnormalities which happen, which uh, are special uh, to the region of the head and neck. And therefore, ENT problems are quite common in, in uh, this condition. Now, so what are these uh, features? <clears throat> I mean, most of us uh, are quite aware of it. So you have this unique, uh, special dysmorphic uh, face, which is very typical. Upward slanting uh, palpebral fissure, which is the uh, eye, basically. So at the uh, bridge of the nose, this uh, so-called epicanthal folds. So you have this kind of uh, space between the nose and the eye, uh, spectral irises, and uh, there's a, an anteroposterior flattening of the skull, which is seen. There are very many changes which happen in the uh, oral cavity, in the mouth, and uh, all the face, so called simian crease. There may be some difficulties with uh, learning, and uh, in general, and uh, uh, also if you may have some problems in the neuromuscular uh, areas. So all these are uh, fairly typical abnormal abnormalities which happen uh, also. Let's first talk about the ear. Very typically, the ear canal in uh, babies with uh, Down syndrome, even adults, tends to be much narrower than uh, in other people. So this leads to a very common problem, which is accumulation of wax. So a lot of parents will come and say, you know, this, uh, this collection of wax fills up all the time, you know, and it doesn't clear up. And then we have to go around trying to find an ENT person to clean it. So what is the way out? Now, this is actually uh, an, an integral part of the Down syndrome problem, because even though it's a very trivial problem, it's a problem which is very real, uh, nevertheless, for many, many parents. So one of the simple solutions for this is, of course, to regularly clean the ear. Now, how do you regularly clean the ear? Not with earbuds. So please don't uh, mistake me. I don't want anyone to be putting earbuds into anybody's ears, your ears or children's ears. You know, Down syndrome, no Down syndrome, whatever, but no earbuds. So what next? The ear canal has a very unique mechanism. Uh, the so-called wax, now if this is a uh, cerumen, is this normal secretion, just like uh, like sweating. And there are special glands in the ear canal which secrete the, uh, the material which forms this. But this is initially liquid and then it dries up in the air and becomes like solid. This uh, material tends to collect the external canal. The skin of the external canal has a unique property of migration. It tends to move and in a very slow, very, very slow pace. So we don't see it because it's such a slow pace. But the way it does it is the cells multiply from a central point in the ear drum, move outwards, and gradually the skin moves from inside to outside and then falls out. And in so doing, it carries anything on it, whether it's wax or whether it is uh, uh, dead skin, bacteria, anything. It just carries it out, it comes out, and then it falls out. So all you have to do is to clean the exterior. But if the canal is narrow, then it's quite possible that this may accumulate uh, uh, and start blocking. So use uh, simple uh, ear solutions which are meant to liquefy this serum. So there are many proprietary preparations, you know, soluvax, wax, all. There's so many number of things. So any drops which are and to dissolve the wax, use it regularly every month. So keep three days in a month, let's say first, second, third of every month. On those dates, use four or five drops to both ears. So make the child lie down, put the drops, keep some cotton, 
leave it for five minutes, take it out. Then after 10 or 15 minutes, use Nadiya. So this you do two or three times a day, three days in every month. This will dissolve the wax, liquefy it, and it will help it to come out easy. So the problem of accumulation becomes much less. I won't say it completely takes away, but it definitely will ease things for you. And even if it is collecting, then cleaning it by an ENT surgeon becomes so much easier. So this is the first common problem that many of the children have. Now the other uh, issue, of course, is the external ear, ear itself. The, the size of the external ear, the so-called pinna is called. It's uh, usually a little smaller than uh, normal, what you would expect normal. Uh, so this may have, because this pinna has an important role. Uh, if you see animals like, uh, let's say, a cat or a dog, uh, the cat is facing forward and make noise from below. So you can see the ear twitching. Oh. And the way reason it moves, this is called prayer's reflex. It's a, the reason it moves is to go towards the source of sound and so that it can maximize the collection of sound. So the role of the external ear is to collect the sound. Humans have lost this ability to move the ear, excepting in, in circus uh, clouds and so on. So we have lost ability because of muscles which are meant to move the ear canal have become very, very thin and unhappy. The ear canal itself, the ear itself has become fixed. So basically the ability to collect sound becomes less important unless we turn our heads. But it's even more so in children, in babies with uh, Downs because their ear, canal, I mean, ear size is even smaller than what you would expect for the normal age. So this could be a problem in sound collection and sound localization. What do you mean? Picking up sounds, of course, and then also to localize where the sound is coming. It's coming from my right or left, above me, behind me. That localization of sound also may get affected in some, some babies. Now, the other eardrum itself tends to be very thin in uh, babies with trisomy 21. And this may lead to small perforations or holes in the eardrum easily rupture, uh, very, uh, very, very delicate structures. So this could be a, a real issue in uh, Down syndrome babies because many of them may end up with permanent perforations. So you, you have a lot of reasons why the ear gets affected, but at the end of the day, you see ear problems in a substantial number of babies with trisomy 21. So, much as uh, from, you know, from 38 percent to 78 percent, if you look at different series, a huge number, and and a lot of children uh, are supposed to say more than half or even two thirds of these children will have some ear issue at some point. And if you compare with the, the children who don't have price of 21, it will be they have hardly you, you see two or three percent of children having problems corresponding age. So this is about 25, 30 times more than normal. So ear diseases or ear problems are very, very common in uh, Down syndrome. Now, hearing, of course, I need not emphasize how important it is. See, vision connects people with objects, but hearing connects people with people. So hearing is the essence of communication. And if hearing is impaired, then our ability to connect with another human being gets very much impaired. And in very young babies, hearing is the first step for cognitive development and language development. What do I mean? It is through hearing that a baby acquires language. It's a very complicated process of receiving sounds attaching meaning to sounds, then just keeping these sounds in the memory bank in the brain, retrieving these sounds, and then imitating these sounds. That's how language develops. So it's a very complicated process, which is why the first uh, function to be affected in any neurological problem, in, in uh, that growing baby, any neurological problem, whatever it is, the first casualty is language development. So that is the first casualty that we have to keep in mind. So this is the reason why, because the most complex function of the brain. Also, 
the cognitive development. In other words, the development of a, a person's intelligence. So if you have a hearing loss and you don't correct it, you can cut down the intelligence of that person. So a baby's intelligence uh, as it grows up can have a serious, serious uh, uh, you know, problems if the hearing loss is not corrected at a very early stage. So this is a very, very important point to keep in mind. So you cannot have even a 5% hearing loss in a baby. Whereas even a 30 or 35% hearing loss in an adult is acceptable. You know, if I have a 35% hearing loss, which I probably have at my age anyway, it's quite fine. I can uh, you know, go on my brain development, how I'm going to be affected. And in fact, at my age, development of brain is very limited. So, but in a baby, it's, it's that's when entire neurological development is happening. The circuits in the brain are working feverishly to form new circuits to develop uh, various, uh, uh, you know, interlinked uh, uh, pathways. So that's how intelligence develops in a baby. And for this, hearing is the fundamental platform on which the, uh, the development of intelligence happens. So these are two very important functions, development of language, and development of intelligence. Hearing is the basis for all. Now, as I said, there are many reasons why ear, ear infections and hearing loss can happen in baby. One, of course, we already talked about very narrow ear canals, but half the babies. There is a hypoplasia in the mid face. What do you mean? The, the middle portion of the face development becomes less. Uh, it may not be fully developed. And there could be a lot of problems in this area. Now, one of the important uh, structures in this area is, a, is what we call the eustachian tube, which is a tube which connects the middle ear with the back of the nose. And this tube is a very important tube because it helps to equalize the pressure in the middle ear with the atmospheric pressure. What do you mean? So, we have in the ear canal, we have a ear drum. Behind the eardrum is a space which is called the middle ear. Now this is filled with air. This air in the middle ear is connected with the external atmospheric air by this tube at the back of the nose and connects to the middle ear. This is it. Normally this tube is closed, but it opens whenever we swallow, we yawn, we uh, you know uh, take a deep breath. So so many things. So Every time you drink a glass of water, so this is why in a flight, when you're coming landing, your ear gets blocked. You, they ask you to chew some coffee or chewing gum or drink a glass of water, then go up and the, the popping thing goes. So basically, this eustachian tube is what maintains the pressure of the middle ear on par with the atmospheric pressure. And if this tube doesn't function well, the air in the middle ear gets absorbed and then you have a negative pressure in the so this is a situation where the eardrum is there, outside is the atmospheric pressure, inside the uh, drum, behind the drum, in the middle ear, pressure is low. So what will happen? The drum gets pulled into the middle ear. We call this retraction. It's pulled in. And over a period of time, it's not corrected, the negative pressure will lead to fluid accumulation in the middle ear. And this is known as a middle ear effusion. Or effusion means collection of fluid. So middle ear fluid starts collecting. And when you have this fluid, immediately the, the function of the eardrum becomes less. So hearing loss starts coming up. And we may have about 20, 30, 40 percent hearing loss uh, because of this fluid collection. So if this eustachian uh, tube function is not optimal, children or even adults can end up with hearing loss, which comes because of the negative pressure in the middle ear and fluid collection. Again, also remember, there is a, a general reduction in immunity in many of these children. And this affects the ability of the body to fight a lot of infections. Now, the ear canal is one of the most infected areas in the human body. The ear and the nose are full of bacteria. And now, of course, with the coronavirus, everybody is aware of the, you know, the risk to the uh, person from the virus entering the nose. Similarly, Corona is not the only virus. Every bacteria, every virus which enters a human body enters either through the nose or the mouth. Most of the gets into the eye. So basically, the nose, the ear, all these are full of bacteria. Not hundreds of bacteria, thousands of bacteria, but 
hundreds and thousands of them. So these bacteria are lying there. Normally there's no problem. They, they live with us. They learn to, you know, they form colonies there and they settle out and then they die, new colonies form. It's a common soul, you know, it's a, a, a existence, coexistence with people. Uh, but when the immunity comes down, then these uh, organisms become a little cheeky. They start getting uh, more courage and start becoming invasive and then infections happen. So this is another problem in particularly in dogs. So otitis media or middle ear infection. Otitis means inflammation and of the ear and media means middle. So middle ear inflammation. So behind the drum, I told you how fluid collection is If instead of fluid, there's infection also, the fluid becomes pus. And this may rupture the drum and deform. So this is a, a, a endoscopic view of the ear drum. And you can see the eardrum is, you know, normally it's early white. It's looking very red, inflamed, inflamed. And you can see this big hole. And initially, and we also remember that I told you the eardrum itself can become very thin and down. So this ability to rupture becomes even more. Initially, when you have a middle ear infection, which is very acute, what we call acute arteritis media, this rupture happens, the pus will come out, infection settles down, and the hole will close. But if this becomes a chronic affair, then this hole becomes permanent. And this is what we call a permanent perforation. Now, this has several problems. One, it becomes a, a portal of entry. So every time the child gets some water, has some uh, you know, infection, uh, sorry, uh, sweating, the sweat and water will enter into the middle ear through this hole. So carry the bacteria from the external ear into the middle ear, which is normally, middle ear is normally sterile in most of this. Now, the, once the bacteria enters the middle ear, of course, then you will have infection happening repeated. And the very fact that there is this hole means there is some loss of hearing. And uh, because of the loss of hearing, you, know, you have this uh, 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 long term consequences which we already talked about. This is yet another type of what it is media. Here you can see it's a little different, there's no hole, but you can see a very cauliflower like uh, structure. What this is, this is known as a cholesteatoma. This is again an infection. It's a chronic infection. It's a deadly infection. It tends to go invade into the bone of the middle ear and the bone around the ear, slowly eating away the bone. The pity is that there will be no symptom. There will be no uh, ear pain or only symptom that they may have some very thin watery discharge or they may have a hearing loss eventually. But this tends to be quite aggressive. It eats away the bone, spreads inside. And eventually, the risk is that it may eat away the bone. And uh, remember, the bone around the ear is the base of the brain. So it can easily go off into the brain and start producing intracranial problems like uh, brain fever, uh, brain abscess, and so on, which are very serious uh, issues. So this cholesteroma is, uh, is something which you don't like at all. Whenever we see cholesteroma, we are all hyper alert. And uh, the only real treatment for this is surgery. You do not have medical treatment. For it. it has to be uh, similarly also for a permanent perforation. The perforation has to be closed. These are all done by a surgeon, and this is known as microsurgery. Very delicate surgery, which is done through the ear and uh, behind the ear to clear the infection and to repair the ear drum and reconstruct the very fine, delicate hearing mechanism of the middle. Now, uh, the other issue is hearing impairment and how it may be masked. Now, when there is a, an IQ issue also, when there is a low IQ, if there is a, also a hearing impairment, a hearing impairment and IQ uh, issues have, have very close relationship. How, how so? Because of the uh, hearing impairment, its IQ may get affected. So a child who is intelligent, normal IQ, May actually become subnormal simply because hearing loss is existing there and it's not correct. So similarly, when a child has got a low IQ, if the child has got a hearing loss, it may be very difficult to pick it up because when the child does not respond, we will not say it is because of uh, a hearing impairment. We will think it is because the child is subnormal. So a lot of uh, children with hearing loss are uh, easily overlooked in Down syndrome because you know, a child does not respond normally 
it's put down to an intellectual impairment rather than a hearing loss. So it's very important in all the Down syndrome children to have at some stage, probably as early as possible, a normal hearing screening to make sure that the child has got normal hearing. And this must be the baseline value for every child. So in fact, to be very honest with you, this is this should be done for every child, not just Down syndrome child. Every child who's born should have a neonatal hearing screening. This is the norm in most civilized countries. So if a child is born today, today or tomorrow, the child should have a hearing screening. And this should tell us that the child has got normal hearing. This is so important. And it is a norm in most countries. In fact, I'm now fighting for that in uh, both in the government of India and in uh, Tamil Nadu state. Uh, fortunately for us, the health minister in the government of India now, Harshwardhan, is an ENT surgeon and a good friend of all of us. So at least, you know, he knows the importance of it and we can reach out to him and we have. He is very sympathetic about it, but unfortunately this COVID thing came and, you know, the whole uh, attention has gone into that. But it's so important to screen the hearing of every child who's born and Down syndrome babies particularly so. We need to make sure that there's no hidden uh, hearing loss. If it's a complete hearing loss, you pick it up. But if it's a partial hearing loss, it's very easy for us to actually, uh, you know, uh, overlook that. Now, uh, so, uh, so that's why I said we must have an audiological screening at birth. And then it should stop with that. Because as we see, you know, there's so many issues which can keep coming up later. So literally, you should be screening them uh, or checking the hearing at least once in six months, up to the age of three. Because that's the most crucial age when language development and intelligence development happens. It's the first three years of life that 90% of your intelligence is established and your language development also happens. So therefore, first three years, you have to be constantly on the vision. Ideally, every six months, a child should have a hearing screening to ensure that everything is fine. After the age of three, you could do it once a year and that will be nice to have. So what are the problems we can have? So first is what I told you, already told you about middle ear effusion or collection of the ear. This is due to chronic gestation tube problems, where you say two less one, well, for a variety of reasons. And uh, when that happens, you know, the, uh, the negative pressure in the middle ear leads to a collection of fluid. And in fact, this is a eardrum which is retracted or pulled in, and you can see an amber color. Normally, this is pearly white. So you can see here, it's almost like honey amber color. And uh, this is due to the fluid which is behind the drum. So what do we do? Then, you know, we may have to drain the fluid and put it into the Usually, of course, we give them a trial of medical treatment. This usually will go on for anything from one to three months. And uh, these are drugs which are meant to decongest the nose, decongest the eustachian tube, and open up the eustachian tube and help the fine. But if it doesn't function, I mean, in about, uh, let's say, if you have 100 children with effusion, you know, in about uh, 60, the medical treatment will work. In about 40, it may not work, despite medical treatment. If it doesn't work, then it's very important to drain the fluid and put it in a tube. And this tube is known as a grommet or a ventilation tube. And uh, here also you see another type of grommet, it's known as a T-tube, the longer stay grommet. Now this grommet stay in, in the drum and they connect the middle ear with the external ear so that the middle ear pressure becomes uh, equalized with the external ear pressure. The moment we do this, the fluid drains out and more important, the middle ear pressure becomes equal to the external atmospheric pressure. So the ear drum, once again, gets back its normal function. And all this means hearing loss is corrected. The child gets normal hearing. So you cannot have a baby having hearing loss for more than three or four months at any cost. Because that has repercussions on, as I told you, as the intelligence is out of the So middle ear issues, this fluid collection and so on, accounts for the vast majority of children having hearing loss in Down syndrome. Up to 80% of children who have hearing loss in Down syndrome have problems in the middle. And what are the other problems which can happen? If you leave the fluid for a long time, it can rupture and produce a perforation. So you get infected and it produces a problem. That becomes a bigger issue. It becomes a much bigger issue. Surgery also becomes a more complicated surgery. The other problems are, the, there are this is the cross-section of the ear. 
this is the electron layer and this is the ear drum and then you have this very fine bones in the middle ear the very very tiny bones you can't see with the naked eye only with the microscope you can even see they are the smallest bones in the body and there are three of them and they form a chain and they connect the ear drum with the inner ear so when sound hits the ear drum the ear drum vibrates sound goes via this uh, pore to the inner ear and uh, sound is trans the vibration is transmitted to the inner ear that's how we hear sometimes these bones may become damaged or they may get fixed with scarring and so on so they don't vibrate it all these are consequences of the chronic infection or the chronic fluid which happens in the middle ear not being treated on time. Very rarely you may have congenital anomalies which are affecting the middle ear bones, which also may lead to problems in the middle ear and hearing aids. So this is a, a surgical uh, view uh, of the, uh, uh, the ear. This is the middle ear, and you can see that the bones have been damaged, and I've felt surgically reconstructed them. This is known as a, 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 a tympanoplasty, and here the mastoid bone, which is the bone behind the ear, has been opened out. The patient has been cleared. This is the ear drum being repaired. So this is a, a microscopic view. You know, it looks very uh, big and uh, looks very gross, but actually these are all enlarged views in under a microscope. It's very, very, very small. Uh, so very fine work which happens and then the baby's hearing will be restored back to normal. Now sometimes the external ear problems and the middle ear problems are chronic and they even if you you know are trying your best to clean and so on, it leads to chronic ear discharge leading to uh, skin problems in the external ear they can all uh, the you know always wet ears, oozing ears. And in this situation, a hearing aid may not be may not possible to fit. Because if you fit a hearing aid, immediately it will flare up. Immediately the infection will flare up, the child will flare up, the child will not tolerate the hearing aid even for four or five days, then you have to take it out, allow the infection to settle down. And these are very common in external ear skin uh, conditions. And this is fairly common. So hearing aids, uh, even though may be required for a child who's got a partial hearing, it may not be possible to fit it. Now, one of the things which has developed recently in the last uh, 20 years or so is a so called bone anchored hearing aid. This is a, a remarkable piece of technology where we surgically fix a hearing aid to the skull behind the ear. So, this is the ear, that's the skull, and this is made by a, a titanium uh, screw kind of thing. So, the, uh, it is fixed onto the skull and the titanium is a metal which has a unique property of integrating itself with the bone in the body. So once you fix it, it can just become part of the bone. And then you can fix the hearing aid onto this uh, titanium fixture. So when you do that, the sound is collected and it is transmitted to the skull. And through the skull, it can go directly to the inner ear. It can bypass the external and middle ear and give sound and hearing directly. So these children, even though they have an extended ear problem, don't need a hearing aid fixed to the ear. You are fixing it to the skull. The sound is picked up, transmitted through the skull into the inner ear and the children start hearing. So this is a, a very elegant solution for children who have chronic discharging ears, which does not settle down, you know, uh, even with uh, protracted treatment. Or, or, or in other words, it settles down but keeps recurring. And for that reason, cannot tolerate hearing aids. So the bone anchored hearing aid is a very elegant solution in these people. And of late, we are doing quite a lot of this, uh, particularly in children with Downs. We also do it in children with congenital development anomalies of the ear, external ear, middle ear, and so on. And these children can get normal hearing with, with bone anchored hearing aids, lead a normal life, and then you know go on to higher. Uh, positions in life. Now, this is a different situation. Now, here, the middle ear is not the problem. The inner ear is the problem. So this is what we call a sensory neural hearing loss, where the inner ear itself is not functioning. So the external ear, middle ear, they are fine. The sound is collected, it starts metered, the middle ear goes to the inner ear, which is known as a cochlea. But the cochlea itself is abnormal and it's not functioning. And then these children have a very severe to profound hearing loss. Now the inner ear of the cochlea 
has several uh, anomalies which can happen in Down's. First of all, it may be what we call hypoplasic. In other words, it's not fully developed, it's small, it's partially developed. The inner ear uh, connections to the brain may be affected. The nerves connecting the inner ear to the brain may become small, may not be developed. So the, the neurons which are in the inner ear, which uh, is responsible for the sound being collected from the ear, may be not fully developed. So, so many problems can happen. But whatever it is, inner ear anomalies can happen quite often in Down syndrome. And in them, if you have a profound hearing loss, there's no use fitting a hearing aid or even a bone anchor hearing aid because you pick up sound, you give it to the inner ear. The inner ear should be in a position to receive the sound and process it and take it onto the brain. If the inner ear itself is uh, faulty, there's no point in collecting sound and giving it to it because then there's nothing, uh, the, the inner ear does not have the ability to receive that sound and to function. So therefore, this becomes a, a real issue. So in this situation, you have to bypass the, you know, the damaged inner ear. And uh, this is what we, uh, we do nowadays when we are doing a cochlear implant. So uh, when do we do a cochlear implant? We do it, first of all, for inner ear problems, not in middle ear or external ear problems, where the inner ear is not functioning. And if it is a very severe to profound hearing loss, which cannot be corrected by a hearing aid. It's beyond the range of a hearing aid. Even the most powerful hearing aid that we have has limitations about how much uh, amplification it can give. So if, if you amplify the sound and give it to the inner ear, there must be some residual function in the inner ear to receive that amplified sound. But if the inner ear is very severely damaged, then even if you give fully amplified sound, the inner ear, you still cannot, you know, give enough hearing, then that uh, person will not benefit from a hearing aid. So for them, a cochlear implant is done. And a cochlear implant basically is a, uh, is a, you know, a, a device which is a bionic ear. So here you're seeing various forms of uh, hearing aid. It's known as a in-the-ear hearing aid or canal hearing aid. This is a behind-the-ear hearing aid, so on. Now, Generally speaking, we want behind the ear hearing aids. We don't want in the ear hearing aids. This can easily fall down. They may look cosmetically nice, but they tend to fall down easily. And children cannot make it. Go so for a behind the ear hearing aid. Have a hearing aid. Now, this cochlear implant basically, as I told you, is a bionic ear. It's a system of electrodes which are implanted into the ear. The moment you see electrodes, a lot of parents panic. My God, are you going to electrocute my child? No, it's not like that. The electrodes are fixed into the inner ear and their sound is received just like any one of us by a microphone and then this is uh, you know converted into radio frequency. Radio frequency then stimulates the uh, uh, electrode in the implant which is kept inside which then sequentially stimulates the cochlea. The cochlea is like a giant piano. You have different frequencies spread out over the entire cochlea. Just like in a piano you have keyboards and each keyboard has a different frequency. Here in the cochlea also, you have this uh, different frequency. And when you play this cochlear piano very fast, you can produce music. If you can play it super fast, you can make them understand speech. So that's how the bionic ear functions. It's a miracle, really a miracle of modern uh, technology, wherein we are able to replace a completely lost function, logical function. First time ever that uh, we were able to uh, you know, uh, replace a lost uh, neurological function. And in fact, replace a, a, an organ which is damaged completely. So this is the first step towards a bionic man. But the bionic ear or the cochlear implant is an extremely successful um, uh, device which has restored hearing today in hundreds and thousands of children. Now, in, in Tamil Nadu alone, um, the state of Tamil Nadu alone, the government scheme uh, we introduced in uh, uh, in the year 2006. Uh, from then, uh, you know, slowly we have been doing implants for your cost. And today, we have more than 5,000 children who have got back hearing, who are otherwise profoundly deaf and would have become deaf and dumb if nothing had been done. And today, they're all, they have picked up hearing, they have got back hearing and speech. And I have children now, you know, I have been doing implants from 96. I have children today who are not just successful in life, 
a very very successful in life i have children who are senior vice presidents of companies some of them are uh, vice presidents of asia pacific uh, region and so on so when i see them uh, you know they are doing so well in life at a very young age and uh, so bright and so brilliant it makes me feel you know that uh, my whole life has been meaningful only because of that so it, it's an amazing uh, piece of technology which restores hearing and therefore communication language intelligence we have implanted a number of down syndrome babies also in tamil nadu and uh, i have done down syndrome babies from all over the country and all over the world so many of them done so well it's so heartwarming to see them you know growing up you know like all of the language talking becoming self confident self assured young people so restoring hearing is is a very very important thing and if it is an inner ear problem then a cochlear implant can who are the people who need a cochlear implant these are children who have or adults also who have lost hearing due to problems in the inner ear or the cochlea which is a case in if you take uh, you know all children with uh, profound hearing loss 95 96 percent of these children problems in the inner ear so they can be corrected uh, of course uh, the middle ear gives rise to a different type of hearing loss as a conductive hearing loss we talked about already here you have a, a sensory neural hearing And these are people who do not benefit from a cochlear implant. So we first of all give them a hearing aid to a trial, see how much benefit they get. We have methods of checking that. And if we feel if we find that the hearing aid is not adequate, we are storing hearing to an adequate level. Then we have to opt for a cochlear implant. Now correction of hearing loss in Down syndrome babies greatly reduces the overall burden of hearing and improves the quality of life. a very very important step and this is why i put it up as a separate slide so correction of hearing loss in down syndrome is of the utmost importance nothing is more important than that and it will not only reduce the burden of habitation but overall quality of life and you have to do it at the earliest as i already told you the first three years of life are crucial are very very important and the earlier you restore hearing normal better the outcome of the child in the long term better the quality of life so keep this in mind hearing equals cognitive development in other words hearing equals intelligence so this is something that is very very fundamental for every one of us to do now coming to the uh, you know father problem which is very common which is obstetric syndrome a lot of us are asking questions so we will we we'll talk about it in our in some detail Now uh, this is again a, a vexing issue in Down syndrome. Uh, children who tend to snore very loudly are generally likely to have sleep apnea. Snoring is a what we call a cardinal symptom. It's an important symptom of this condition. Uh, now that children who do not snore are still at high risk. So it doesn't mean that only snorers are having sleep apnea syndrome. Even you may have. Sleep apnea syndrome (OSAS) means obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. So you may have sleep apnea syndrome, but you may not be snoring. Now these are known as silent snorers. You know this is also another category, and they are very important. Now what is this sleep apnea syndrome? Sleep, you all know. Apnea means stopping of breathing. So basically, these children when they go into deep sleep, stop breathing. Now why do they stop breathing? because they have an obstruction to the breathing passage so they are they're making efforts to breathe but the oxygen is not going into the lung it is getting obstructed and this may happen due to a variety of reasons but somewhere along the breathing passage deep this collapse of the obstruction and because of the obstruction the oxygen in the air the breathing in is not going into the lung and children are not receiving enough oxygen this is a serious issue So, of course, it doesn't mean only babies get it. Adults also have it. In fact, adults are very, very prone for it. Every one of us, after the age of forty-five, you know, uh, we have a very high possibility of developing sleep apnea syndrome. So, you have an adult who's snoring. You know, most likely, for all probabilities, he has sleep apnea syndrome. Now, we may not, uh, you know, take cognizance of that. And generally, you know, whenever a man comes and snores, we say, "Oh, he's a happy guy." You know, he's uh, Most of us get born to sleep. We tend to make fun of it, but 
is nothing to make fun of it. It could be a uh, evidence of sleep apnea syndrome, which is a very serious illness. So basically, snoring is a cardinal symptom, but not all sleep apnea children or adults have snoring as it have sleep apnea still without the uh, snoring. Now, what is this condition? Now, there is a partial or complete obstruction or blockade from the upper layers between sleep. And this is typically episodic. What do you mean? It is not continuous blockage. It is intermittent. There is a blockage and then breathing stops. And because the oxygen is not entering the lung, the oxygen level in the blood starts falling. The moment it falls to a critical level, the brain will say, oh, look, you're dying, wake up. You know, so it'll wake you up. So you wake up from deep sleep to light sleep. And then you once again start breathing. So these are episodes. So in an in a hour, you may have 10 episodes, 15 episodes. In some others, it may, there may be even 60, 70 episodes, almost once every minute. So you have these episodes where the, the breathing stops due to an obstruction or uh, due to a collapse of the thoracic obstruction. And this leads to uh, apnea or stopping of breathing. In Down syndrome babies particularly, sleep apnea has a very high uh, possibility. More than 50 percent to 100 percent even in some studies have some degree of sleep apnea. So it's very important for us to be very cognizant of that, to be looking up for that. And generally speaking, in, in uh, sleep apnea in children, as they grow up, the sleep apnea tends to come down in most children. But in Down's babies, paradoxically, it may not. It may actually get worse. That's the reason, the reasons I will look at it. But many of the reasons are because even as they grow up, the anatomical abnormalities, which are uh, you know responsible for that in the first place, may not correct. They may actually get worse. So in children uh, with Down syndrome, obstructive sleep apnea syndrome is a big problem. Almost uh, the vast majority of them, and also doesn't uh, change with uh, advancing age. Now, the reason why it's so common is because of the anatomy, uh, anatomical development in the Down syndrome baby. I already told you that there's a lot of anomalies in the, in the mid phase. It also happens in the neck and the lower phase to some extent. All this adds on. So they may have obstruction, not at one level, but multiple levels. So if the child may be having obstruction in breathing, the breathing passage, and this may not be just at one level, just saying, oh, my nose is blocked, or it's happening because of adenoids. It may not be the only reason. There may be multiple levels, and we need to evaluate where all this obstruction is happening. We want to get a complete picture of this. So, what are the symptoms of sleep apnea syndrome? One is nocturnal aneurysm. A lot of these children will, will wet their beds. And they pass urine in the sleep without realizing it. And it happens even when as they grow older, beyond a certain age. Second is there may be a paradoxical chest and abdominal motion. Now, whenever we breathe in, the chest and abdomen will, uh, will, will be having a movement which is corresponding. But here, you know, the, because of the obstruction, there may be an abnormal movement of this chest and abdomen. So there's a paradoxical. Then, Normally, in adults, when we have sleep apnea, you don't sleep very well at night. What happens is, in the daytime, you tend to catch up and therefore you tend to become sleepy. So these are adults, if you have sleep apnea, you see them sitting, in a, just sitting quietly in a place, they'll be dozing off. You know, the flight, they'll be sleeping, in the airport, they'll be sleeping, if they're sitting in the chair and watching TV, they'll be sleeping. This is typical in adults. But in babies, it actually has an opposite effect. These children who are, who are deprived of sleep because of sleep apnea tend to actually become rebellious and tend to become more hyperactive, sometimes a little more aggressive than they normally do. So uh, this kind of uh, behavioral abnormalities and hyperactivity may be indicative of sleep apnea in babies, unlike in adults. The yeah, abnormal shyness could be another factor which you see in these children. Very interesting. A lot of children develop attention deficit. So, in fact, there's many studies which have shown that children with attention deficit disorder in, uh, in, in childhood, 
lot of them have uh, hidden sleep apnea. So this is a, a, another uh, problem which uh, may happen. So this is something that you have to keep in mind. So when, before you label a child, a child is having attention deficit disorder, think or investigate whether the child has got a sleep apnea issues. Irritability, I told you already, they can be hyper, little hyper in the morning. Right? They may have momentary breath holding. So this becomes another issue. So, you know, even sometimes when they're, they're sleeping, of course, they hold the breath, you know, and then you, you're waking up. But even they're awake, sometimes this may happen. So this is another issue. And then one of the problems which happens as a, a part and parcel of sleep apnea, whenever the obstruction to sleep happens, there is a negative pressure. The child is trying to breathe in, but there's no pressure. So in the, in the back of the throat, near the larynx, there is a negative pressure. This negative pressure literally sucks the contents of the stomach into the throat. The throat is normally alkaline. So whenever the acid comes into the throat, it causes a chemical inflammation. So this is what we call as a reflux disease, gastroesophageal disease. Even more specific, it's called laryngopharyngeal reflux. So this is a, another issue, which is part and parcel of sleep apnea syndrome in children. Cardiovascular problem because of the chronic obstruction to uh, the breathing in sleep, oxygen level keeps fluctuating, keeps going down and up. And when it is low, it, it leads to other repercussions. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of strain on the cardiovascular system as well as the central nervous system. So the two major casualties are the brain and the heart. And in the heart, it can produce a variety of problems. One of the problems is very commonly seen in uh, sleep apnea syndrome in children is what is known as a pulmonary hypertension. In adults, it leads to systemic hypertension. We have an IBP, but in children, the pulmonary vessels are affected. They lead to pulmonary hypertension. And uh, this has a lot of repercussions on the way the heart functions. It can lead to chronic heart disease and so on. And eventually, it cuts down the lifespan of the baby. So, this is an important uh, long term. It doesn't happen in a hurry. There are slow changes, but these slow changes are important because they take away the quality of life as well as the longevity of. What are the pointers? What are the issues, the things that you should look for? As I said, already loud snoring. This is a cardinal symptom. Choking episodes, you know. So every time there, there's an acid reflux, it comes the larynx closes as a protection of the lung. The, the acid enters the lung, damages the lung. So the larynx will close. So they end up with choking episodes, trying to breathe. So a snorer who also tends to choke, very, very typical. Many of them are mouth breathers. So they tend to breathe through the mouth because either the nasal congestion is obstruction becomes or they're trying to get extra oxygen into the system. Cyanosis during sleep, the child stops breathing, the oxygen level comes down, the brain tends to turn blue. So you know this is what we call cyanosis. Daytime somnolence may happen. I told you already, you know, either they may become over irritable or they may be sleepy and drowsy in the daytime. And uh, they may get up with headaches, complaining of headaches. These are older children. You know, they get up and say, what a headache. Now, that's an indication of carbon dioxide buildup during sleep. Unfortunately, it is during sleep that the baby grows. Growth hormone and so on, all these hormones which are essential for growth and development of a baby, for a baby to thrive, happens best when you're sleeping. So if your sleep is disturbed, then automatically the growth of the baby is not fully uh, So this is another long-term consequence. Repeated upper airway infections, so that's another common symptom. And uh, as I said, already degustation of acid and something common they happen during sleep. Now, uh, what are the, uh, the, the anatomical anomalies you know, which are associated with the sleep apnea syndrome. So basically, there is an hypoplasia or, or partial development of the jaws, you know, so mandible and the maxilla. So these two jaw bones are not fully developed, they tend to be small. As a result of that, the palate or inside also becomes shorter. There's a relative macroglossia. What does it mean? The tongue appears big. In actual fact, the tongue is not big, the tongue is the same size, but the mouth is small. 
So there's a relative macrocosia. The on the mouth, tongue looks big. This is you'll see as though the tongue is fully filling up the whole stomach, whole mouth. So this is the what we call macroglossia. Because optosis means the tongue is actually coming out. It's, it's so big it, it cannot, the mouth that it cannot contain it. Even partially coming out and staying out all the time. There is a narrowing of the, the throat, the lower pharynx, and the back of the nose. There is a generalized weakness of the muscle of the body. It has a relatively small larynx. And add to it obesity. Now, what you have to realize is every three kilos we add on, the requirement for us to breathe goes up by 30%. So, if I add on three kilos, I have to breathe 30% more air. Now, the space we have for breathing is the same. Not just because I'm putting on weight doesn't mean my larynx is getting bigger. Oh, it's the same. So, at one point, there's a mismatch. So this happens to every one of us. And that's why obesity is a very common cause of sleep apnea. Same applies also in babies. So, you know, even though it's nice to see an obese baby, it's not a very healthy thing. So, you know, babies putting on weight, you know, which is uh, uh, more than what they should normally be uh, for their age and their, uh, their dimensions, is not very good for sleep apnea. Because the air parents, there may be a relative obstruction. And uh, also the associated cardiac problems which already happen in Down syndrome may add on to the problems of sleep apnea also. Because there also you have cardiac issues. And both are coexistent. So each can make the other worse. So what are the common situations? Now here is a very common situation. There are large adenoids. What is adenoids? This is a skull x-ray. You see the mouth. You see the jaw. This is the macula or the upper jaw. And this is the neck. Now, this is the nose. This black is air. So this is the nose. And the nose, normally you have this black going all the way into the throat. The entire area is air. But here you see, I have put an arrow, you see a whitish shadow here. This is a soft tissue, which is blocking the back of the nose, the area called mesopharynx. This tissue is the adenoid tissue. What is the adenoid tissue? It's a normal tissue, which is present in babies. And it has a function for protection up to the age of three. In fact, adenoids are functional. They have a function of protecting. They, they produce antibodies. They are an immune organ. They help to eradicate the bacteria which are entering through the nose. So they have a defensive function. But if these adenoids get very big, it literally physically blocks the nasal pathway. So you can see that the air column is back here, back here is interrupted by this adenoid, which is blocking it. So this child will have, we cannot breathe through the nose. So here you can see, this is the back of the nose. This is the palate. This normally, this will all be open. So the child breathes through them. Here the adenoid is totally plugged in, like I said, somebody's put a cord there and plugged it. So this child cannot breathe through the nose. It has to be an obligatory mouth breather. It has to open your mouth and breathe. It's the only way it can breathe. So this is a very common situation for sleep apnea. Similarly, tonsils, and this is inside the mouth. You can see the teeth here, and you see the tongue there, and this is a soft palate and the pal and the uvula here. Now, these are the tonsils. Now, sometimes the tonsils become so big that they can literally physically block off the passage here also. So, enlarged tonsils is another common cause of obstructive sleep. These are the two most common causes, but no means they are the only cause, but these are the two most common causes of obstructive sleep apnea in children in general and certainly in Down syndrome. No, no different. So how do we assess that? So we, first of all, you examine the baby. You can see an enlarged adenoid, tonsil, all that you can physically examine. But apart from that, we also have investigation. So a simple x-ray, like I told you, to identify a large adenoid can be picked up by just an ordinary uh, simple plain x-ray. But we have more and more sophisticated tools nowadays. So we have two important tools which are very, very important. One is a, what is known as a polysomnography or a sleep study. Here, the baby is made to sleep in a sleep laboratory. And the baby is monitored by a specialist who is a specialist in sleep medicine or an ENT. We have a very good uh, sleep lab here 
and uh, we've been doing it from like, almost from uh, 1990 or 92 or so and what we do is the baby comes here this technician who connects the baby to various uh, you know monitors and so on and the baby sleeps out so when the baby is sleeping we are looking for several parameters looking for how many times this baby stops breathing what happens to the oxygen level when this baby stops breathing is there snoring if so how many times is the baby snoring how severe is the snoring are there any physical movements when there is obstruction is the baby struggling and what happens to the brain waves when the baby uh, you know is having uh, obstruction to breathing what happens to the heart when the baby is uh, stopping breathing so multiple parameters are studied and this happens uh, overnight the baby comes at night sleeps morning goes home and the next day we, we again repeat the study it usually happens two nights the second night we correct try and correct it by giving a, a piece of equipment known as a cpap we we'll talk about it in a minute but it be corrected and see is there any correction which is happening with the cpap machine it's almost correct uh, is it fully corrected so we are looking at also usually it is a two night study and we have this overnight study done in a proper sleep lab uh, with proper facilities so this gives us a, a, a what you know as a functional uh, So we we know what every time or the information about what's happening during sleep. The second study is known as a dynamic MRI. Here there is an MRI, but which is dynamic. That is when the baby is sleeping, we are doing the MRI. We are getting information in real time. So here you can see the various structures. You are seeing the tongue. You are seeing the spinal cord. You are seeing the vertebral column. You are seeing the throat. You are seeing the nose and so on. So we are actually able to see where is the obstruction. what sort of obstruction is it is it front to back side to side so we can have various views you know we can have a detailed view of the entire breathing passage in a video format in real time this is a very sophisticated study which is now you know available in many centers in the country we do this also known as a sleep mri or a dynamic mri so when the baby is actually sleeping we do the study and we follow the patient so this is an anatomical study so here in the dynamic mri we get information as where is the blockage is it at one level multiple levels if so which are the levels at which obstruction is happening what is the structure which is causing the obstruction in the in the sleep mri sleep study or polysomnograph we actually get a functional study report we get how bad is it what is happening to the oxygen level is there any changes in the heart is there changes in the brain so what is the effect of this obstruction so that is one so both are complementary we get information about uh, the uh, full picture we get a complete story and we get to these two investigations these are the two cardinal investigations now for uh, investigating a sleep apnea so in fact now if the recommendation is basically that all children with down syndrome who have some evidence of go through a sleep study at age of 4 years in fact the american academy has now incorporated the american academy of pediatrics has made it into a, a, a part of its guideline so for all down syndrome uh, children since 2011 it has now become part of the american academy guidelines but here in india we don't do the, so much on it but it's important if a child particularly i won't say every down syndrome child should go through it but if a child is symptomatic if it has loud snoring if it has all the features that i described to you if it is sleeping in abnormal positions like if it is sitting up and sleeping you know some it is lying prone and sleeping so abnormal positions a uh, child keeps his mouth open and it is struggling so all these are indicators about sleep apnea in that case please you know do a proper sleep study in a good center with information don't don't uh, just say you have to go away and not go away so you have to investigate the baby problem so how do we manage basically management depends on where is obstruction you know and how severe is obstruction so the previous two tests that i told you will help you to decide about the management if you cannot manage every sleep apnea in by one single procedure you know as a saying that if uh, you the only tool you have in your hand is a hammer then every problem looks like a nail you know that's not how it works 
So you have to be objectively assessing the baby, seeing what is the cause of obstruction, where is obstruction. The majority of the children, the obstruction is usually the adenoids and toxins, therefore, tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy is done. But if you have obstructions in multiple levels, then just pulling out the tonsils and adenoids is not going to solve the problem. So you need to evaluate and find out the various levels at which obstruction happens and then correct it. The CPAP is a, is a machine. It's a machine which gives air, just normal atmospheric air, not oxygen, normal atmospheric air, at high pressure. So there's a mask which fits into the baby's nose and mouth. And the machine gives pressure, synchronizing with the breathing of the baby. So when the baby is breathing air in, the air is pushed in by the machine. So whatever obstruction happens due to collapse of the tissues, the air pressure, because it's higher, it opens out literally this obstruction and ensures that the air enters the lung. In other words, it's acting as a splint. A splint, which is a pneumatic splint, which is actually the air itself acts as a splint. The air literally forces open the collapsed tissue and ensures that air enters into the lung and the baby is getting in the box of the lung. So this is a support to the normal breathing of the baby. And uh, it, it ensures that baby gets in a box and there's no deep apnea, there's no hypoxia, in other words, no lowering of oxygen in the baby's lung. Then, if uh, there are other procedures you do, suppose the tongue is the main problem, the collapse of the tongue, I told you there's a little macroglossia, there's a large tongue into the mouth. So there may not be enough place for the tongue in the mouth, it tends to collapse and block. And this is also a fairly common problem in Down syndrome. Now, if that is the problem, then just pulling out tonsils is meaningless. So here you have procedures which are done to advance the tongue, you know, or resect out excessive part of the palate if it is blocking. You may advance the jaw, the tongue is used to the jaw. You know, so if you pull out the jaw forward, if the jaw is a problem, supposing the baby has a very low, you know, retracted jaw, the jaw may be pulled forward and hung along with that. Uh, and all that can be done. Of course, in very extreme cases where you know the baby is literally you know every night dying, you know, that the obstruction is so severe, oxygen level is bad, that you know it's a, it's a life-threatening situation. Even the last resort is to make what is called as a where you open the you know the uh, the windpipe in India, and we have an opening with a tube. So in daytime, this tracheostomy is blocked and the child is breathing normally and carrying on. At night alone, this is opened out because it's acting as a safety valve for the baby. This I have already done in two children in all these years where they are so, you know, life was so critical because every night was a miserable episode for the parents. Parents would not sleep for days on end just waking up the baby whenever the child comes. So this is a situation where it's an extreme situation. Very, very rare. And once the baby grows up, you know, we treat the other obstructions that we, we can make with them. So here is the maxillary expansion, which is being done by a dentist. So if the jaw, upper jaw development is very small, it's not happening. Today, the pediatric uh, dental surgeon can actually do things to make the jaw grow, you know, can uh, develop the jaw. So a lot of, uh, you know, the pediatric orthodontists have now developed techniques or development of the upper and lower jaw without surgery also. So these are also now in parts and a lot of them have successfully managed uh, sleep apnea in children. Cleft palate, uh, again, is a, is a common problem and it also leads on to sleep apnea because the, the cleft palate also has a floppy palate. So even if you repair the cleft, many of the children have obstruction because they uh, Palatal function itself is not very good, and the general muscles in the throat are not adequate. They're hypertonic or they don't function well. So these children tend to obstruct that. Uh, many of these children with uh, uh, Down syndrome also have uh, re recurrent sinusitis, and this is because many reasons. One, I told you there's a reduced immunity. Large adenoids behind the nose itself can be a cause of recurrent sinusitis. Uh, chronic tonsil infections can be raised to that. Some of them have poor functions of the, the nasal line and so on. So all these are the reasons why uh, you know you, you may have uh, recurrent sinus disease in these children. 
and they may develop polyps, which also causes obstruction. Uh, it leads to the Alzheimer's disease and also adds on to sleep apnea. So all these are uh, interrelated problems. Uh, I already told you about reflux. This is a picture of the larynx. You know, this is uh, known as the stroboscopy. You can see the larynx, the vocal cords. This is a foot passage. And you can see here a little inflamed tissue. This becomes uh, inflamed because of the acid which is coming from the throat, trying to get into the larynx. And uh, gives rise to chronic inflammation. Because as I told you, the larynx is normally alkaline. So any acid causes a chemical inflammation. These children will have a hoarseness of voice, sore throat, uh, you know, and uh, sometimes the voice may crack, uh, and uh, all these issues may happen. So basically, uh, the changes are happening in the larynx and in the throat in a chronic uh, format. So this also has to be recognized. And uh, this is the tongue and the back of the tongue also, they may have which is similar to tonsils, this is known as lingual tonsils. So this also may get enlarged in children. Again, leads to sleep apnea in children and uh, you know, can the same symptoms. The worst is, of course, the airway anomalies where the airway itself gets blocked, the breathing passage gets blocked. One is the larynx. The larynx generally in Down's babies, they are very prone for what is known as a laryngomalacia or a floppy larynx. This corrects with the age, but they are very young, you know, they are present with a crowing noise, you know, <laughs> that kind of crowing noise. So when they are sleeping, and this indicates that they are breathing, whenever they are breathing in, there is a Obstruction they are breathing in. So, this is a very frightening experience for parents. Usually, they come and say, My God, what's happening? The baby looks like it's almost choking. Well, it is actually because the entire larynx is floppy. And this can be corrected you know, very easily. Usually, most often, we don't do anything. We just investigate, see it's not too bad or right suddenly. If it is not, we just reassure the parents saying, Don't worry. You know, a little turning of the baby's position is on, will adjust it. And as the baby grows, it will get corrected. If it's very bad, if it's interfering with the oxygenation of the baby, then there are simple surgical procedures where we can release the larynx and reduce the floppiness of the larynx and uh, improve the uh, breathing of the baby. So more serious conditions are in the breathing passage itself. This is a very, very serious problem. It needs surgical. I won't go into that, but that's a very fortunately not so common. Then the other is the so-called atlatoaxial instability, where the neck bones are instable. Now, this may lead to neck problems, you know, what we call nautic problems, stiff neck, chronic neck pains. They may lead to some neurological defects and so on all the time. So this is a, not a uh, nice condition. But if this is so, then you have to recognize it. Orthopedic uh, surgeons may interfere and fix it. Neurosurgeons do it fix this instability and make sure the spine is Now again, uh, one uh, simple thing to remember is whenever any surgical procedure is planned for a Down's baby, for whatever reason, you have to remember that anesthesia is a special consideration. And it must be done by pediatric anesthetists who have special knowledge of the problems in Down's baby. One, this is no exception, whatever surgery. And same applies also to EMT surgery. I know it may be a very simple operation. It may just, just take five minutes. But anesthesia, whether it's a five minute operation or a five hour operation, is the same thing. So you have to be very clear that the anesthetist is properly briefed and knows about this baby, has seen the baby, assessed the baby, full knowledge about this baby. Then only can you take up the baby for anesthesia. So anesthesia in Down syndrome needs a and must be done in a good center. Don't go and say, yeah, okay, some small thing, you know, properly done in a good center with proper facilities. Uh, you know, the experts who have experience in managing these conditions. Want some people are not able to hear you. Can you speak a little louder? Okay. So I'm almost coming to the end of my process anyway. Now, apart from that, you know, there are some very rare anomalies, which I probably don't have to talk about, but one is the so-called tracheoesophageal fistula, uh, where the breathing passage and foot passage become connected. But this has to be operated and also separated. But this is a very rare anomaly. Thyroid problems can happen in, in babies, 
and there is a small but uh, uh, an increased risk of malignancy in long term in these babies. It's not very rare. So finally, to conclude, uh, in Down syndrome, the two major challenges are ear infections and sleep apnea, and of course, to some extent, some sinus disease and airway obstruction. The most two major challenges are ear infections, hearing loss, and sleep apnea. But this accounts for at least three, four uh, of the babies in Down syndrome, or sometimes in some series, even up to 90, 95% of babies may have one of these issues. And you have to evaluate these issues, correct them, because they have long term repercussions. Uh, you know, whether it's a hearing loss or whether it's sleep apnea, there is a long term repercussions and you have to be addressed. Many of them are, uh, you know, uh, they have very Clear symptoms, which are depressing. So you know that there's a problem and address those issues. Go to a center near you where this can be done. And uh, you know, the most medical colleges now have facilities for because I had some questions coming and people were asking me, I'm I'm from Chandigarh, I don't have a facilities for sleep apnea. Of course, there is you have to all you have to do is to go to PGI. You know, PGI has got facilities for sleep apnea studies. Is a very good uh, sleep department in the ear department has a, a dedicated uh, sleep laboratory there. So almost all major cities in India now have sleep laboratories and ENT surgeons are very aware of it. So they can evaluate your child for sleep apnea and uh, diagnose the condition. You can find those various obstructions. Now, the majority of them may not require surgical intervention, but some of them may need. So if they need it, then go for it and do it. Don't deprive your child just because he was worried about you know, bed right knee or worried about surgery. It doesn't mean the child has to suffer. But when you're going for surgery, ensure that you're doing it in a very good center where all the facilities are available. Anesthetists are particularly well-trained in pediatric anesthesia and they are very uh, aware of uh, the uh, significant issues in Down syndrome. If you can evaluate and correct these problems uh, at the right time, it has a, a lot of impact on the quality of these children in the long term. Many of them have very good quality of life and can go through life without any hassle. So this is really important for us to remember. So I will stop my presentation there. Now, if any one of you wants to ask me questions, please feel free. Be more than happy to address. I, I think I have touched on most of the issues that you have raised. But if there are yes, doubts, yes. please ask. Me. Yes, uh, there are quite a number of questions uh, uh, on. Yeah. And uh, we will start off. Some of the questions have been shared to you. Yeah. Uh, I can uh, read it out that uh, my daughter, who's a 35 year old, had ear discharge and got operated a left ear nine years ago. There was no discharge problem for some years. Now she complains of ear pain in the right ear. She gets ear discharge on and off. She has hearing loss too in both ears. One year ago, she was given hearing aid in both ears. That's not helping her. As it, uh, it should, as I feel, she cannot hear properly. Please let us know what best can be done to help her. I am told to put Siplox D ear drop and uh, that she shouldn't get cold and also use ear plug when she takes part. Yeah, well, I think I think we already addressed this issue. You know, ear discharge can happen from a variety of conditions. It can be due to chronic ear uh, middle ear infection. Can be due to perforation. Somebody has to see the child, see the baby, or see the uh, uh, child and see where is the what's the cause of the perforation, or is it perforation? Is there an outer ear infection? What's the cause of it? And if there is a rectifiable cause, it can be rectified. Most of them are rectifiable. It may need uh, correction. And then uh, if there's nothing there, and it's just only a chronic uh, external layer infection, as I told you, the way out is to go for a bone anchor hearing aid. So if the child has got a, a problem in the chronic discharging ear and doesn't tolerate hearing aids, go for a bone anchored hearing aid, uh, and the bone anchored hearing aid will give excellent hearing, you know, normal hearing. It's a small surgery, but it's a very small surgery, and it can be done uh, you know, in, in a few minutes. So you implant the uh, you know, uh, uh, fixture into the skull behind the ear. It's only a supervision, it's not going into the brain or something, it's just in, on the skull supervisionally. And you can keep the hearing aid to that. So you can avoid a hearing aid, but they will have very good hearing. Yeah. 
and also Vijay Negi wants to know that uh, her son who is 16 and a half years old has some sleep problems and they are in Chandigarh. So are there any sleep centers in Yeah, I, I already mentioned this particularly. I saw the question. The PGI has got an excellent center. Okay, PGI. Okay. So the other thing is uh, uh, they, they just want to know uh, how does the child have sleep apnea? I think you covered it in your lecture. Yeah. I mean, how does it and, and keep sometimes mouth open and what do you do? So every, many people are concerned about the child always keeps the mouth open. Yeah. They enlarge adenoids. Yes. So, we talked about it. Yes. Yeah. So I think that also has been done. Uh, so they have done another 2.5 year old child. Uh, when he was 8 months old, they did a Vera test in his ears. Result was left ear is profound and right ear is able to hear at 90 dB. But what our observation is that right from birth, he can hear small sounds even in sleep too. Whether the test was wrong, what you have It can be. It can be. No test is perfect. It's, any test is only as good as the person doing it. You know, Suresh will uh, understand it very well. It's, uh, the, it's not the machine, but the man behind the machine who is important. So if you are in doubt, redo it, you know, recheck it and uh, that will tell you exactly, you know, how the situation is. Sometimes, you know, these tests have a, 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 an error margin and these error margins, you know, you may be in that very rare one person error margin. So redo it. Uh, and I, in fact, ideally, as I said, every six months you should do it for the first three years. And after that, annually you should check your ear. Okay. So one test may not... Uh, be yes. Uh, one, one sparrow never made a spring. Yes. Okay. So then an 18 year old daughter makes a clicking sound with her tongue very often at night. Yes. Sometimes she makes the same sound when she's very deeply involved in either heart or patient. Yeah. In fact, somebody has to see that actually, but very likely, you know, the baby has got an allergic uh, rhinitis where the eustachian tube is getting blocked. And there's one of the tricks babies develop to open the eustachian tube. So they keep doing the sound in the back of the nose. And every time they do that, the eustachian tube opens and it gives them comfort. So this, to me, it, you know, that's the first thing that comes to your mind. Has your child got nasal allergy, chronic allergies, or chronic eustachian tube problems? So that needs to be checked. Another five-year-old boy was uh, having uh, sleep problems, but uh, then uh, the, the concern is that tongue has several cuts on yeah. both right and left side and can't eat spicy food as you tried several times. So the tongue has got cut off. Yeah, this is a very uh, common presentation in chronic acid reflux. You know, when they have the zeringopharyngeal reflux, then the, uh, the tongue has glossitis or inflammation of the tongue. I told you uh, normally the oral cavity and throat is, is alkaline, so any acid causes the chronic inflammation. So this this could be the main factor. Okay, this Muttaraj wants to know, daughter, ten year old <coughs> has a thumb sucking habit. Is there any way we can break it? <laughs> this is one of the biggest challenges, you know. <laughs> it's very easy. Uh, for, you, for anybody. For it's anybody. for anybody. It's not nothing specific about downs, and it can happen to anybody. Uh, yeah. One of the, the common things in our villages here is to put some beam uh, based on the hand. You know? so, you traditional, hand method, <laughs> traditional method. And I think as uh, they grow older, things they come out of it, yes. Come out of it. So, uh, uh, Dr. Lalita Joshi from Nepal wants to know why there is increased evidence of abnormal sleep apnea in childhood grows older. Do abnormal sleeping positions like sleeping bent forward at the waist uh, and the weight in sitting position indicate an underlying sleep disorder? Yes, yes, I already said that in abnormal positions do indicate uh, high possibility. Is adenotonsillectomy yes, adeno curative for OSA in a child with DM Down syndrome? If the obstruction is due to adenoids and tonsils, as I said, assessment of the level of obstruction is very important. And if it is due to adenoids, but large majority of cases of uh, sleep apnea in children, in Down's babies, is due to adenoids and tonsils. But not all, not all. So you have to assess that. It's very important. Any any specific exercises or drugs for sleep apnea? No. Basically, there, there is a generalized lowering of muscle tone, but all you know exercise is, is good. And encouraging babies to be physically active is a very good thing in sleep apnea. So I play with them, you know, have physical games, which is good for, them for improving the muscle tone, not just uh, mental games and computers and so on. So get get more physical with the babies. Okay, actually, uh, uh, Mr. Suman Kanikeri has got a conflict. There are two doctors, an endocrinologist and a physician 
who have given opposite points of view because one of them uh, says that uh, uh, she needs to be on a sleep apnea put on treatment and needs to be tested for that. Whereas the physician does not recommend such a test and treatment as it be disturbing sleep pattern. Uh, so you have discussed. No, no, I, I think treatment. what they need to do is to go and meet a, an ENT surgeon uh, who will do an assessment for sleep apnea or a sleep physician. Well, yes. they, will do a, they will do an assessment and then know whether the baby's got a sleep apnea or not. Yes. After they assess the uh, you know, baby, then depending on how severe it is, you can then start getting you know, the treatment option. Yes. So I think he is already under the care of the, uh, the ENT surgeon. Yeah. I think they should listen to the ENT surgeon as That's far right. as the disorder is concerned. And uh, so, uh, so Bharti Shah from Pune uh, wants to know, uh, so you got a 33-year-old Down syndrome daughter. Uh, if you can, the best way to keep their ears clean and yeah. uh, keeping the eyes and eyes in good condition. Uh, right. I, we have to ask doctor what he said. The ear generally keeps itself clean. You know, we don't need to do anything about it. But yes. because some of the babies have narrow ear canals, I told you already. You know, every month you can put some ear drops, which are meant to dissolve the wax. Make it into a habit. Once a month, regularly, five six months, you do that, and ear gets automatically regulated. But please don't use ear buds. Yeah, so a 35 year old son has got an infection in the right ear. When they use antibiotics, it becomes okay. But when they stop the medicine, again it comes back. Yeah, he has an underlying chronic problem. Maybe he's got a perforation, maybe he's got cholesterol. So please get it checked by a proper ENT surgeon and then get it sorted out. Don't, don't ignore it. Yeah, they've got frequent itching and pain in the right ear. They use solo wax many times. But what yeah. is the remedy for this? That may not be the remedy. You know, it may be having cholesterol uh, and yeah. you may be putting ear drops. In. Yeah. So, uh, do you uh, recommend any specific ear drops? I think no, under no. PHC. Uh, Never drops. recommend anything. You know, you, What I would recommend is a proper diagnosis. So, yeah. please get an expert to see the baby, if the patient. You know, it's very important. Don't yeah. go yeah. blindly treatment. You know. Treatment as follows diagnosis. Treatment cannot replace diagnosis. Yes. There's a question from Facebook uh, Live because it's also going live on Facebook. Uh, my son Shubham from two to three days saying he cannot hear from, hear from one ear properly. Very little sound is coming. Maybe because of fungus. So We don't know if it's fungus. You know, it's, this is a very, very important symptom. In fact, it's a medical emergency. You should immediately take him to the nearest good ear department. Have his ear checked. Maybe that he's got a sudden hearing loss due to inner ear problem, in which case it becomes a permanent hearing loss. A sudden loss of vision, sudden loss of hearing, these are all medical emergencies which need immediate intervention within 24 hours ideally. So please don't assume anything and say it could be fungus, it could be wax. Please get it checked up. If it is something like fungus or wax, everybody is happy, but you don't want to miss out a inner ear problem because that could be a permanent lifetime problem if it's not corrected within the first 24 to 48 days. Yeah. Uh, so my son, 11 months old, and his uh, hearing training was negative three times. We did a bear at five months and he showed elevated hearing. He was non-responsive then. However, now at 11 months, he's very responsive and active. Should we repeat bear again? Yes, you should. Every yeah. six months, please repeat. And also, if the child is born premature, then they have to do the vera little Absolutely. later. Okay, my child, uh, two point five years old, cries when little louder sounds come around him. What kind of treatment does he need? Nothing, nothing. Usually, you know, this is a, uh, a fairly common pro problem in children that they have a high increased sensitivity to sound. It will settle down usually as a baby grows up, so you don't have to worry about it. But check the hearing. Okay. So, uh, uh, regarding the, uh, I think everybody, has, a lot of people have got the sleep uh, apnea. Is, is there, uh, uh, you said there is no medication for it, right? No. There is there's not no medication for it. And secondly, this child uh, sits in between sleep in the night and keeps her head on her father's tummy for a longer time. So, it, is it related to she feels comfortable in a particular position? Yes, that's right. And, that's right. And that is something which uh, we have to definitely. The understand. baby has possibility of sleep apnea. Need to investigate. Yes. Uh, okay. My son, 22 years old, need wax removed after a few months, but at times 
let it sticky discharge the seed. Is it the natural way of cleaning or some drops are required? Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. A little bit of wax will come out. It's normal, so don't get worried. Just clean the outside. Okay. Uh, I think uh, sort of we have. Uh, Please mention the name of ear drops displayed on screen. I I'm not sure whether that is done. No. Uh, I think the ear drops must be prescribed by the doctor who sees the. That's right. Exactly. That's very very important. All medications in general, uh, we should not take medication by listening to somebody That's or right. taking from somebody because the same problem in different people may need different kind of medication. So make it a point to meet your local physician, ear surgeon, whoever is required, and take the correct treatment. And take it seriously. So, right. Some second. Uh, okay. So that has diagnosed with velopharyngeal, uh, mild velopharyngeal. Uh, how can it be corrected? Is velopharyngeal insufficiency? Is there a cure? Can yes. the child go for swimming? Yes. For velopharyngeal insufficiency, it can be corrected. If it is very mild, you know, we give them exercises. A speech therapist will usually be able to do that. We give exercises which will help the correction. If it is very significant, then it, we have surgical options for correcting it. You know, so that also is there. But that is in, when it's a very you know significant velopharyngeal insufficiency, where there's a lot of regurgitation every time you drink water, it comes out and things like that. But otherwise, simple exercises are there which a, a good speech therapist can give you, and then it. So if, if you have done a tonsillectomy and an adenoidectomy, and after that still, uh, after some for a year and a half, he starts breathing through the mouth again, then is there a... Uh, yeah, it could, it could be due to other issues. For example, there may be a nasal congestion due to allergic rhinitis, for example, you know, which may be the cause. Or, you know, there may be other issues also. So that's why I said it's very important before you jump onto a tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy. You know, have a proper evaluation to see where is the obstruction. You know, what is the level of obstruction? It is one level of obstruction, multiple levels of obstruction. And you have to look at the whole picture, have a holistic approach to it, not just you know look at the tonsils and nerves alone. That's why I said, if you if your only tool you have in your hand is a hammer, then every problem looks like a nail. You know, so we can't do that. You have to look at the baby objectively, see where is the obstruction, and then Yeah. So uh, somebody wants to know. In Gurgaon, is there a specialist you know who can do sleep study? Oh yeah, everywhere. You know, Gurgaon is a big place. Every big, every hospital there, I'm sure, will be able to do sleep study. So there is no shortage of uh, facilities in our country. Believe me, you know, we, every big city now has facilities for sleep study. So it's not a problem. And interestingly, when everybody asked, they said, "Tell me a good doctor," and they asked it for another doctor. <laughs> my answer is every doctor. Is a good doctor. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. <laughs> if you're a specialist, uh, we, 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 because they are qualified, they have experience, and they will always do their best for the patients. I think that's very important to understand. Yes. So there are no good doctors and bad doctors. They're always more doctors. <laughs> than doctors. <laughs> that's what you have to say. Okay, I think uh, we've had, uh, thank you, Mohan, we've had an excellent applet, uh, Rekha, to say a few words. Yes. And then, uh, uh, Thank you yeah, so much. Uh, Dr. Mohan, I cannot tell you how grateful we are to you for having you come for such a long time. I mean, the whole of India was asking for these issues. And I cannot <laughs> tell you how you have actually, tonight everybody is going to sleep peacefully. And it was something that they were waiting for for a long time because sleep and anything associated with breathing has become an issue today. So everybody thinks, okay, my, my child is like this, so I, maybe I have to consult an ENT. But since we thought your subject was top of the ladder, we wanted you there, sir. Thank you so much for your time and the elaborate uh, way you have explained every bit of it. Dr. Suresh, we so much thank you because you're always there for us. Thank, <laughs> thank you. So thank you so much. much. Thank you. I, actually, the parents will be able to sleep very well. Once <laughs> you have doubts cleared, then really? we know, yes, we, we've got answers for our questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doc. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you all. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, sir.